This morning, I want to continue in some way the theme that uh, we've been discussing this year uh, in regards to uh, serving the Lord in a wholehearted fashion. Uh, we looked at Matthew 6, 33. I'm going to read that again. But I really believe that the Lord in some way is just really impressing these, uh, these thoughts and these themes upon my heart. And I don't know how to express it other than I feel the prayers of the church. I feel that you're praying for me. I feel that there are prayer warriors that are praying for the direction of this church. And I believe that God is calling us uh, to serve him wholeheartedly this year. And he wants to do great things in our midst because of that newfound commitment. And so Matthew 6, 33 says the following, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What a simple verse that is, but the entire Christian life our entire hope of success and even nations hinge upon the ability of the people of God to take hold of what an amazing promise this is. And so we want to be found faithful. We want to understand that Satan is bringing all of his demons, all of his strength, all of his effort is so designed in order to keep us from seeking first the kingdom of heaven and there are no end to the lies and the level of deception and there is no end to the confusion and we understand that the heart of man is deceitfully wicked who can know it and so the devil will do anything working with our deceitful heart um, in order that we might be under a delusion that we can seek first the kingdom in a year from now or in the future. I want to read in some ways a parallel passage that by the Holy Spirit helps to illustrate this concept and the urgency and the demand of the King of Kings upon you and me and on his church um, in modern times to hold to this, this commandment to seek first the kingdom and to be wholehearted and to exalt Jesus into a place of lordship, that he is the king and that he is commanding us to give our everything to him. And I want to just stop for a second here and just um, make it very clear that I am preaching to myself I do not claim uh, to be holier than thou. In some ways, I would say that this is um, a message that uh, the Lord is speaking primarily to me. I believe it applies to all of us. And so this is the great need for preachers. This is the great need for the church in America to wake up, to be alert. And as we're hit with so many different um uh, disasters such as COVID and fears and, and different worries and, and different temptations. The Lord, in the midst of these trying times of distraction, He wants us to be offensive and to focus wholeheartedly on seeking first the kingdom of heaven. And so this is a challenging text, but let us uh, walk through this together Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 16. This is, uh, this text is, uh, we're going to read this together. Luke 14, beginning in verse 16. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. I want to just stop there for a second. They all alike began to make excuses. 
I want to submit to you that the problems that we have uh, in the church and in our lives, in our relationship with the Lord, are relatively simple. It is not great intellectual problems that uh, we need the brain of Einstein to unravel, but uh, more than likely, it is a heart issue and inability to accept the plain message of the gospel. And isn't it true that excuses in so many ways keep us from being pleasing to the Lord? And this is the very problem that Jesus is highlighting. I want to ask you uh, the following. Does the, the Lord still answer prayer today? Is the Lord still almighty is he still, uh, is his power unsearchable? Is he faithful uh, to fulfill the endless promises of God in the New Testament that apply to us? And so the Lord is sovereign right now. He is powerful in the heavens. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And so on the, on the Lord's side, he is perfectly faithful. But the problem, church, is on the human side. And it has to do with things such as excuses, which keep us from realizing the purposes which God has for us. And so let us look here at what um, these individuals uh, that our Lord depicts say. The first said, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, I just want to stop there for a second. And I understand the text can be difficult sometimes for us to grasp. And sometimes uh, we have the kindness of God and we have the severity. I just want to float this question. Does the Lord still get angry. This is a depiction of Almighty God, a surpassingly worthy King and God. And here he is brokenhearted. He is frustrated. And as the text depicts our God, he is angry. And as he looks at um, individuals today, as he looks at even his church, and he sees mountains of excuses in the world. I believe that the, the Holy Spirit is grieved. I believe that the Lord even experiences anger and deep frustration. And I want us to consider that as we uh, follow the rest of this text. He says to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet." And so there is another uh, depiction there of the Lord's anger of those who make excuses and reject and uh, dishonor the worthiness and the kingship, the lordship of Almighty God and refuse the gospel and this great banquet that is open to us. And I want us to focus perhaps here in a spiritual sense uh, to understand what this means in the kingdom of God. Who are those that receive Christ in this invitation 
and do not have excuses that hinder them from obeying the gospel and giving their lives wholeheartedly to the king. Look at this description once more. He says, go out quickly to the streets, to the lanes, to the city, and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And I think this description here is of those who are desperate for the Lord, who are brokenhearted in this world, who do not treasure the things of this world above Almighty God, but they're hungry for the Lord. And they're willing to receive the gospel as it's presented. And then they have this sense also that the Apostle Paul put before us that all things are considered rubbish. It is nothing but but poverty and, and weakness and everything apart from God is wrought and they see that they are wretched and pitiful and they are blind and naked apart from the riches of Christ and that's where the Lord wants us to be. He doesn't want us to be prideful and to be too big and, and high and mighty to be able to busy to serve the Lord. I've got better things to do. Lord, I'm going to have to serve you later. I can't receive this invitation. Can you imagine the absurdity here of Christ offering the gospel to humanity and then for us to reject and say, I've got other things to do and to make excuses to forfeit this high honor to come into this marriage supper of the Lamb. And so that's one place that the Lord wants us to be. And I believe that the different sufferings that we are currently going through, uh, the, the trials, the humiliation, all the things that God is working, the discipline that, that the Father is bringing upon you and your life is all to bring us to that place of brokenness so that we will no longer make excuses or reject the gospel, but that we can come into the light and fulfill this scripture, Matthew 6, to seek first the kingdom of God. This is where uh, the Lord is wanting to bring our congregation. I want to look at just a few points here uh, of application this morning regarding these scriptures. And so the scripture teaches that it is impossible to put the Lord second. It is not possible to put the Lord on the sideline, to put him on the back burner. And so it is not possible uh, to pick and choose which scriptures we want to follow. For instance, if you were to join the Marines, you would not have the ability to say, I want to be involved in these certain activities, but then again, I'm, I'm going to be involved in this, this element of, of training. You are giving your life to serve as a Marine um, in, in uh, the United States uh, military. And so, church, we've got to understand that the call to the gospel is, is far greater. We do not have the ability to pick and choose, but when we uh, respond to understand that Christ is asking for our life, he's not asking for our life tomorrow or in the future, he's asking that you be sold out today and serve him completely according to, to the description found in the Word of God. I want you to also see here that there are always going to be excuses. We're pretty good at making excuses why we can't do things. And also the devil is a mastermind in creating excuses why it is not um, reasonable to serve the Lord Jesus today, right now. And so the devil uh, will bring um, endless reasons why we cannot follow him uh, before um, us. And we have to uh, be alert to that. 
We have to understand um, that this is what the devil is up to, and we have to test our own heart um, as to and, and weigh in the balance uh, the excuses that we have to the call of God in the gospel. I also want to, um, along these same lines, point out another um, uh, sub-point here. Our circumstances are never going to be ideal. I want you to think about uh, the apostles who Jesus randomly showed up in their life and he called them to drop their nets and follow him. He came to Matthew as he was in the middle of business and he said, leave your tax booth and follow me. And so every man and woman of God who has been called by the gospel, that Jesus has divinely appeared to them, that the Spirit of God has spoken to the depths of their heart, has been wrapped up in the things of this world and it has not been convenient for them by the world's standards to drop the love of the world and to follow Jesus. And I want to submit to you that you are not going to be the exception. I am not going to be the exception of this, this, to this rule. I think of um, a very famous Christian uh, by the name of C.T. Studd. He was uh, in some ways like the Babe Ruth in England. He was a, a celebrity cricket player. Uh, he was a man uh, who had inherited vast uh, fortunes, and uh, he gave up a, a castle and a great fortune in order to serve the Lord and to give everything up to follow him on the mission field because he saw the surpassing worth of Jesus Christ. And so individuals such as this, their circumstances were not convenient. It's not ideal to have to give up fame and fortune and all these different things for Jesus. And in the same way, um, we're going to have to uh, come to terms. We're going to have to count the cost of discipleship. And on the one side, the, the excuses, the demands of life. And then we're going to have to see uh, the, the pressing um, call of the gospel on the other side and the worth of Jesus Christ. And so also consider the following. If we do not serve him wholeheartedly today, most likely we are going to wake up to the reality that our life has been wasted sometime in the future. Perhaps there are exceptions that there are those that can be saved in the last hour but I believe that that delusion, if we are unwilling to accept Christ today, if we're unable to see the beauty and the worth of Jesus Christ, and we cannot see that all other things are, are rubbish today, if our soul is so darkened right now, what makes you think that you're going to be able to reverse this in the future? This is one of the, the devil's greatest lies and so uh, we are guilty if we do not respond to the gospel in an appropriate way uh, because we are rejecting the Son. This is no small sin to reject Christ who has descended uh, to come to the ruined race of Adam, to the likes of, of guilty sinners to, to come and, and live among us to reject him. This is a great sin. And if we reject Christ today, if we're unwilling to give our heart to him to seek first the kingdom, this leads to a hardening of heart as time goes on. And so it is going to become near impossible to serve him sometime in the future if we cannot receive him today. I also want to make this point as well as we are confronted with the endless worth of the gospel, that we must respond to the gospel and we must seek first the kingdom of heaven today uh, due to the fact that the gospel is an urgent message. I want to illustrate this point by the following. Imagine there is a great fire and uh, we call 911 and and the fire department answers, 
And they respond by saying, we're sorry, it's not convenient to respond to this fire right now. We've got other things to do. Do you hear how ridiculous this is? Do you think it would be possible for the firemen to come back in a week and to respond to this fire? Do you think it would be possible to come back in 10 years? Would it be possible to come back in a few years and to respond to this fire and see how much more urgent is the gospel? So our country is is burning down, by the way, right now. Our community is burning down. Our, Our families are in need. The church is in need. East Dallas, there is, there is a fire that is raging for the souls of men, and we cannot hang up the phone and say we're going to respond to this fire in the future or in 10 years. There is going to be great consequences if the church falls asleep and rejects the call of Jesus Christ and the urgent demand of souls. And so there is... Um, a, a weightiness, and there is an urgency, church. We must respond to the gospel today. We must respond to the Lord. It's not possible, uh, or we should not presume upon the Lord that we can, in a few years, work on our prayer life. Now is the time to work on our prayer life. This evening is the time to work on our prayer life, to intercede for one another. We cannot deal with sin in the future. We should not presume to be able to mortify the flesh and to battle against Satan sometime in the future just because our circumstances are uh, are not ideal, or because we're too in love with the world to give everything up for Jesus Christ and his service. I think it is ridiculous uh, and to consider the darkness of the soul, to consider how little um, humanity will sell out of uh, Jesus Christ, how, uh, how pathetic are our goals? How pathetic are our dreams? How small are the riches which the devil uh, provides for us? Even if he were to give us the entire world, it would not register on the scale because who is like the Lord? All the nations are as a drop of water in the bucket before the Lord. They do not compare to his worth and the honor that angels long uh, to look into the things that the Lord has given to the church, that he has transformed us, he has redeemed us, and he has made us ambassadors of Christ to perform the very function of God to serve him in the highest of ministries. And so it is a foolish thing for us to reject the call of the gospel upon our lives. Also want to uh, make this point uh, that the Lord uh, does not promise to wait on you. The Lord uh, can call somebody and he can just as easily bypass them and select somebody else to use them. I think we are so gospel-saturated in this country. Uh, The Bible has collected so much dust in this nation that in some ways we just take the Lord's promises and his grace for granted, uh, and we forget um, the, the... indescribable privilege of the gospel and understanding that past generations have had to come to Christ in a biblical way, whereas we think that we can come um, half-hearted and it is to be acceptable before the Lord. Uh, There are great things happening all around the world where Christians are coming to Christ, where there are moves of the Spirit of God. The living God is doing great things And if America does not humble 
um, herself. If we do not turn back to the living God and to the ancient faith and give everything to him. And I love reading about our forefathers. I love reading about the glory in the church and the strength of the church. And it is clear that there have been great seasons where ministers and preachers and and frontier uh, evangelists and itinerant preachers have given everything up, the brightest and smartest of men that could have been uh, multi-millionaires and and tycoons, but yet they gave themselves to Christ. They gave everything and the church flourished. And this same principle is just as true today that unless a kernel of wheat fall to the ground, it remains only a kernel, but if it dies, it can bear much fruit. And so we're going to have to die to ourselves in order to receive the riches of Christ. There cannot be two gods on the throne of your heart. We cannot love the world or the things of the world and at the same time say that we love the Lord Jesus. We cannot have two masters. We cannot serve money and serve the living God. And so we need to be set free, church, uh, from this idolatry. We need to be set free from our culture that has sold out the Lord Jesus for a, a little bit of wealth uh, when uh, the Lord demands that we serve him with all of our heart. And so once again, today is the day that we are to respond to Jesus Christ. Today is the day that we are to seek the Lord for a burden for this congregation. Uh, Today is the day that we are to seek to to, uh, to to understand the Lord, that the Lord would bring us out of the fog and out of the delusion and out of the darkness and out of idolatry to bring us into the light where we have a white hot passion, where we can um, come from the place of forsaking our first love to coming back to that pure, apostolic, primitive uh, first love of Jesus Christ Uh, where we can experience um, this right relationship with Jesus, uh, where we are walking in the light, where our hearts are aflame, and where um, others see uh, the glow in our face because we are truly sold out to the Lord Jesus. And then, church, finally, the thing that uh, perhaps is something that we should all earnestly desire is that if we are wholehearted. If we can to diagnose what, what are the excuses that we're making in our lives, and that's perhaps something that um, we can go home today or even right now, the Holy Spirit can just lay upon our heart. What excuses are keeping you from honoring Christ as he deserves to be honored? We can list those excuses and, and, and ask that, that God, the Holy Spirit, would burn those up and we replace those uh, with a pure love uh, for him. Um, But church, we need uh, to also uh, consider what is the benefit if we are to put aside the excuses. We understand that the Lord uh, sees when we set our heart to seek him when we seek first the kingdom of heaven, when we truly surrender to him, when he becomes a Lord on the throne of our heart, that is when we enter into a blessedness. I love the old hymn, Trust and Obey. 702, I believe it's the fourth verse, but it depicts Abraham. And it describes how that he could never prove the love of God. He could never fully understand the grace of God until all on the altar he um, laid his, his Isaac. And so it's not church until we lay down our lives. It's not until we give up our idols, until we are totally um, 
in fulfillment of this text, seeking first the kingdom of God, that we can truly be pleasing in God's eyes and open up a flood of of countless blessings in our life. And this is the single greatest need in our community, the single greatest need in our church, to have God's blessing, to have his presence, to have him uh, bless our meetings, to have him uh, tug on our hearts, to have his presence, and for him, the Lord Jesus, to add to our number. And so this is the path, church, uh, to being in the favor of the Lord. For instance, we looked at the first Psalm at the beginning of this year. Um, The blessing is for the one who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on his law day and night. And so this is where the Lord is leading uh, you and me And as I uh, began this sermon, I can feel, I don't know how to describe it, but I can feel the prayers of the faithful. People praying for me and moving my heart in these directions and challenging me and saying, William, this year, I want you to be totally sold out. I don't want you to be double-minded. I don't want you to be thinking about the things of the world, but I want you to be sold out to Christ just like a whole host of godly men who went before. This is your time to make a stand uh, for this generation. This is, t- this is the time for the Main Street Church of Christ to stand up in this awful hour and to say, we are going to to put the Lord to the test in this. We are going to be obedient to him. We are going to be wholehearted and we know that the Lord is going to be faithful. He is going to honor us. And so this is the direction, church, uh, that the Lord wants to take us. I hope that this is your earnest heart. I hope that you will press in to the Lord. I hope you will draw near and to fan into flame the gift of God that is within you, that you will stir one another up Uh, to love and good works, uh, that we will turn back to the old paths, to the simple gospel, that we will test our hearts, that we will allow Jesus Christ to speak to us, to speak to us in the place of prayer, that we will get alone, that we'll find that secret place, and that we will allow the Lord to search our hearts to see if there be any offensive way in us and that we will be so noble and bold through God's power to die to those things that we might allow the life of Christ to flood our nation again, to flood our communities and our churches and our families. And so um, if if this is your desire uh, to follow the Lord Jesus, perhaps, Uh, You want to uh, be restored this morning. Uh, You're welcome to avail yourself of this opportunity to come forward and we can pray for you. Uh, Perhaps this is your desire uh, to go home and just pray about some of the things that we've talked about this morning. Maybe you've never met uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the, the Son of God who came down to this earth, was born um, in humility, in in a manger, uh, who lived a perfect life, the life that we could not live ourselves. He was sinless, perfectly righteous, and yet he was punished in our place in order that we might look upon him through faith and be forgiven of all of our sins. We are to respond to Jesus Christ and the demands of the gospel. We are to repent of our sins and we are to receive him in baptism, to be immersed in water, reenacting the death, the burial, and the resurrection, which is the gospel, to believe on that gospel and then to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. The promise is that we can have all of our sins washed away through baptism, and then uh, receiving uh, God to live inside of our heart, uh, coming out of those waters, uh, following him all the days of our life. If you want to uh, give your life to Christ, there's no better time than to do that today. Let us, church, respond today. Let us not 
put this off. Let us uh, rebuke the voice of Satan, which perhaps is even speaking to us um, now. Let us rebuke that and receive the word of God into our hearts and respond to him today and not tomorrow. Uh, Let us uh, be standing as we sing our song of invitation together.